Well, everybody, I'm so happy you're here. If I haven't met you, my name is Nate. Thanks for everybody who's joining, whether it's here in the room or in person. And uh, We are continuing in our series, Threads. We're, we're taking a whole year and looking at these big like themes in Scripture. And are you ready for this one? We're going to talk about blood and wine. And like every time I talk about something like this, I know there's going to be people here who like, wait a minute, I haven't been to church forever. And you're going to talk about blood. Um, blood's a little bit hard to talk about, but, but here's what you cannot avoid. It is this massive theme that weaves its way through scripture. It's like very, very important, uh, but it, it is a little bit different, right? Um, if you're a phlebotomist, I learned that word not long ago. You're used to it. It means you take people's blood. I, I was just laughing to myself backstage because when my daughter, she was in college and just trying to make ends meet. And somehow, I don't know how this happened, but her Google contacts and my Google contacts got completely mixed up. And one day my phone rang and in all capital letters, it just said blood, B-L-O-O-D, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And I'm like, Who's calling me that has the name blood? And so I answer it, and they're asking for my daughter. And I was like, is this vampire? Could you just fill me in? And uh, she had donated blood and decided she didn't want to do that anymore. And so she had put that in her contacts to know never to answer that call again. (laughs) Right? So, interesting. Did you know that one of the first major criticisms against the followers of Jesus was this, that they were cannibals. So there's this whole fascinating dialogue I read through previously this week um, between a, a Roman official, and he has two friends. One is deeply committed to the Roman gods, and the other is, this, is a Christian. It's about 143 AD. And the, uh, the Roman, who's traditionally committed to the Roman gods, he, he, he says, here's what I know about Christians is they're cannibals. Because one of the things they do is they eat flesh and drink blood. And so that began to circulate throughout the Roman Empire. And it became like this. They, so Christians were, you know what they were called? They were called pagans. They are called pagans. And actually Nero uses this. He purposely burns Rome. He burns it because he wants to create it again in his image. He wants to leave his fingerprint on it. But you know who the easiest group for him to blame was? He blamed the Christians, the cannibalistic Christians. So this has just been a, a, like a point of confusion throughout the church because this idea of blood and wine and what wine symbolizes have been central to the biblical message but can e- be easily misunderstood. So here's what we're going to do. Eventually we're going to get to the place where we're going to take communion together. And hopefully you received that when you came in. If you didn't, uh, towards the end of the service, raise your hand. We'll get that to you. If you're online, I would love for you to find any elements. I, I Don't think it's, it doesn't have to be, you know, grape juice or wine and and unleavened bread. Find something because we're going to take that together at the end as we walk through this idea, this passage. Okay, so let's start. If we're going to talk about blood and wine, we have to go to the very beginning of the Bible. Let's start in Genesis chapter 3 where uh, this is the Old Testament context, okay? So point number one, Old Testament context. Where in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve have been living in this idyllic communion with each other, with nature, with God. And then they rebel against God. And fascinatingly, they're hiding. So they feel shame. There's a chasm that has developed between them and their creator. They're hiding from God. And here's what God does. It's just this little verse in Genesis 3 that God provided animal skins to cover them to help them deal with their profound sense of shame and inadequacy. So one of the problems of human sin is we become self-aware, we become a focused inward, we feel this sense of inadequacy. And so God takes, it appears, the first animal life. That the only thing, those fig leaves are gonna wilt, they're not gonna cover you, but God takes this precious commodity of life, this creation that he loves, and he says, let me cover you, which is a beautiful foreshadowing of what Jesus is eventually going to do. In the next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, you've got two brothers, the two of the sons of Adam and Eve, and uh, they're both bringing a sacrifice. It's the first time this word sacrifice is introduced. They're bringing a sacrifice to God. One brings uh, 
plants and a harvest and the other brings an animal. And God said, it has to be an animal. The only thing that really pays a price that can really deal with your own failure and mistake is the blood of something precious, which is an animal. And then those brothers, of course, one kills the other. And not long after that, this whole idea of the sacrificial system is set up. And here's, here's kind of my best little illustration of the sacrificial system. Imagine this table is humanity. This is us, right? And over by the TV, this is God. This represents God. And this massive chasm has developed. And so because of this, this shame, this place where human beings are is we're inadequate. We can't be with you. We failed. We're self-aware. We're self-conscious. We're self-focused. God says this, the only way that we can temporarily halt this isolation is he establishes this sacrificial system between human beings and God. And so like throughout the Old Testament, you would read about it. There's daily sacrifices. There's sacrifices when I have made a tragic decision and I've, I failed. Some animal gives its life as blood is shed in my place. So instead of me paying the price, something else pays the price and it temporarily creates some sort of bridge between me and God. The problem is that I could have made a horrible decision on Monday. I could have like gone to the temple, made a sacrifice. And then Tuesday, I felt pretty good. I wasn't hiding in shame from God. And then Wednesday, I'm back at it, right? And so the whole chasm has existed once again. But this is the sacrificial system. And Jesus came to fulfill that. Now, there's one other important theme, if we want to understand the context, that would be found mainly or initially in Exodus chapter 12. It's the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb. So Israel has been in slavery for four centuries in Egypt and God has done these nine terrific miracles to begin to lessen the Egyptians' grasp on their hundreds of thousands of slaves that they've built their economy on, right? And so the final thing where Egypt is gonna go, just be free, go, go, is Moses tells them, he says, unless you let God's people go, there's going to be something that happens that is just absolutely horrific, that the judgment of God is going to move through Egypt. And here's the result of this, is that every firstborn male will die. And in the ancient cultures, like firstborn males, that was of utmost importance. That's the person who inherited all everything. So it's like we're, God's going to devastate your culture unless you let people go. You've been abusing them in slavery for 400 years. God gives them a warning. But then he looks at his Hebrew people and he says, God's judgment's moving through, but there's a way that you can avoid this judgment. And so Genesis, or excuse me, Exodus 12, it's the Passover lamb. You took a perfect lamb, as genetically ideal as possible. You took its life, you collected its blood. Okay, we'll get back to this blood. The family inside roasted the lamb. You made a unique bread with no yeast, so it was a flat or unleavened bread. And then as you were eating the lamb, you put the blood from this lamb upon the outside doorposts of your home. Okay, so, I mean, this is really graphic, right? But there's this blood applied to the exterior of your home. And as this judgment moves through Egypt, every household that has the Passover lamb's blood on their house is bypassed. So that's the Passover, that God's judgment passes over you. So then every year, every year, still to this day, Hebrew families celebrate this idea of Passover that God passes over human beings and there's the blood of the Passover lamb. So that's kind of this Old Testament context, like this idea of blood and sacrifice are deep everywhere in the Old Testament. Now let's move into what Jesus is going to do with those two institutions, Passover and the sacrificial system. Jesus is going to give new meaning. We could even say fulfillment. He's going to bring fulfillment to the sacrificial system and the yearly Passover. Okay, he's going to take these two traditions that are just deeply ensconced into Hebrew culture that are throughout the Old Testament. 
And he's going to say, what these have been, are they've been reminders or they've been foreshadows. They've been pointing to what I am about to do through my death on the cross. So let's begin this way, that Jesus is going to have a Passover feast with his disciples. And he's going to take this Passover feast and upend it. He's going to give it a brand new meaning. Let's read together from Luke chapter 22. This is Jesus' last meal with his disciples. It happens to be the once a year Passover celebration. And this is what Jesus says. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying this. this, is this Jesus has done this for 33 years. He's had once a year a Passover meal. And he goes, I won't do this again until this future date when I return and everything is made right and I'll have a feast with you. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them saying this, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance. Okay, there's this reflection whenever we participate in communion. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the, the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant. So that phrase there is really profound. So God has made a couple of covenants with the people of Israel. Okay? He's made a covenant with David. He's made a covenant with Abraham. And Jesus is saying God is now making a new reality. He's making a new deal between human beings and God. And here's what the covenant is. That Jesus will be the Passover lamb. That Jesus will be the ultimate sacrifice. That he will die for us and it's going to heal the rift that exists between God and human beings. This is, cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. And so from that point on, the early church took this idea of Passover, even those who weren't Jewish, and they said, there's this momentous thing that happened when Jesus died. If, if this was our reality and the sacrificial system temporarily could heal our rift with God, here's what Jesus is going to do. Jesus is going to say this, I'm going to stand between God and human beings. I am going to fulfill the sacrificial system. I will be the final and complete sacrifice. I will be the Passover lamb that there is no more judgment upon my people because I died and my blood was poured out for them. It's applied to their life, which does this. It brings human beings back into relationship with their creator. Well, the New Testament goes on to teach us more about this. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead to Ephesians, Ephesians 2.13, where Paul says this. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, distant from your creator, have been brought near. And how are you brought near? It's by the blood of Christ. It's what Jesus did brings, it, it lessens the, the, the distance. Like you've been now brought into relationship with your creator. Something, a price has been paid that you couldn't pay. Blood has been spilled that wasn't your own. It wasn't the blood of an animal. It was God himself saying, I die for the sake of my people. A writer of Hebrews, and he's writing to Hebrew people who know all the traditions. He says it this way as he's describing the blood of Jesus and what it accomplishes. Hebrews 10, 19 through 21. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence. Okay, so this is, just using this phrase is profound. Because Adam and Eve feel anything but confidence in God's presence. They feel fear. They feel shame. They feel inadequacy. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Human beings do not have to feel that way before God any longer. 
You can feel confidence to enter the most holy place. And for these Hebrew people, here's what he's saying. He's referring to the holy of holies in the midst of first the tabernacle and then the temple, that there is this place that is it's off limits to human beings, except for one day a year where the high priest, after a, a whole process of consecration on the day of atonement, can go behind this curtain and go before God. And back there was the, the Ark of the Covenant. It was like this sacred place where you just didn't go. Only, only the most high priest could go one day a year. And here's, here's what the writer of Hebrews says. You can have confidence now to step right in to God's presence, to enter the most holy place. How? By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. The whole sacrificial system is moot, it's done, it's over. Open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, we don't have to live on the periphery with God. We don't have to live in a world wondering, do I measure up? Have I done enough? Could God love me? This is what Jesus did is he, he became the curtain that separated you and God. And it's through his body, through his blood that you just can step forward and be in harmony and be in fellowship with the God of the universe. Jesus fulfilled the sacrificial system. Jesus became the ultimate Passover lamb that nothing else needs to die because Jesus died once and for all. There's one more passage about the blood of Jesus and its association with wine that I want us to read. It's from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this... Uh, this is written early, probably around 55 AD, where you have a group of people in Corinth who are not Jewish, right? So they've learned this idea of Passover. and um, they, they gather together every week to celebrate communion, but it's gone a little bit awry, okay? So here's how the, the first people in the early church, uh, Acts chapter 2, it says they gathered together, they, they shared a meal, they broke bread, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes to them and he says, listen, uh, you're not getting it. You're not understanding how significant the, the whole idea of the death of Jesus in communion is. And so he writes to them this. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. So in the scriptures around this, here's what he said. Uh, you come together and they had a, every time they got together, it was like a potluck. Anybody love church potlucks? I love fried chicken, which is inevitably at a church potluck. And so he says, you come together and you have this meal, but he, here's the problem. Some of you who are wealthy, because fascinatingly, the church is the first place where you have wealthy and poor, you have slaves, you have free, um, you have Roman citizens and non-citizens, they're all coming together, but there's massive disparity in their economic levels. So some of them are coming and they're like bringing a whole picnic box of like fine cheeses and, you know, aged wines. And after the church service, they're having this meal and some of them are drinking so much that they're becoming intoxicated. Okay? And some of them are gluttonous. And then there's other people in the church who have no means whatsoever. And they're just, they're sitting there hungry while this feast is going on. Paul says, that's unacceptable. That's not how we commemorate or celebrate what Jesus did on the cross. So in an unworthy manner, we'll be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And so Paul gives them this warning, like, you just don't want to treat this as a trite, just little ritual, little add-on. He goes, this is deeply significant. His warnings, you can read it, go on. Some of you, you're experiencing sickness because you haven't, you haven't been reverent regarding this, okay? So there's this whole other thing that we have to think about regarding the body and blood of Jesus. Now, I want to just talk about two more things. We're getting close. I want to address just all the questions I get asked. 
not all of them, but some of the major questions I get asked about communion. Because people ask me all the time, like, how often do we take communion? What do you take communion with? Do you have to have a pastor or a priest present when you take communion? And I'll just, I'll tell you up front, this has been highly debated in the church. What hasn't been debated is that communion is, is very sacred and it's special. It's always been highly valued, but the process and how it's supposed to happen, there's been a lot of opinions. So let me just show you a couple of pictures to let you know how important this is. This is a, this is a picture from the catacombs in, in Rome where Christians, uh, they buried their fellow Christians. And you'll find a picture like this. They're kind of rough paintings. But all throughout the catacombs, there's just a picture of the followers of Jesus gathered around a table celebrating that Jesus is the Passover lamb. Celebrating that he's the fulfillment of the sacrificial system, that he paid the price and no, nothing else needs to be paid. And so as the church moves forward, here's the best that we know is that some Jewish Christians, they took communion just once a year during the Passover feast. And so in the Jewish tradition, they thought, well, what Jesus did is he has this Passover feast and he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And they're like, well, we only do this once a year. And so during this whole Easter time, uh, a lot of Jewish Christians would just be like, no, we don't, we don't do it. We do it once a year and it's deeply reverent. Uh, some of the non-Jewish people said they were really used to Every week there's a celebration and so they gathered together and they'd, they'd have a church service like this and everybody would bring food and they would have what they called an agape feast. Agape is one of the Greek words for love. And after service together, they would sit down and they would eat and that's what Paul's addressing. And then afterwards they take bread and they take wine and they say, let's do this together. Let's remember that the ultimate reason that we're here is the death of Jesus, his resurrection, what it's done for us. About 178 AD, the agape feast drops off and people start just taking communion, actually during the service rather than afterwards. And then it just, you know, it starts to morph. Nobody knows. Do you know the New Testament never tells us how often we're supposed to take communion? It would be way easier for me if it did. Um, there's, there's a teaching from about 150 AD. Actually, I'll show you, I'll show you a, a, a picture. It's the didache, right? So which comes from didactic or teaching. Um, this in Greek is handwritten. It was lost for 1,200 years. It was found once again. So it's referenced by a lot of the church fathers, the first century church fathers. Um, but it's found in 1873 by an Orthodox priest. He finds it in a library in Istanbul, Turkey. And it, it literally says this. These are the teachings of the apostles to the church. And it's our first record of what an early first century church service went like. And it talks about taking communion doesn't give us the frequency, but it says, make sure this happens because it, it's, so, it's such a powerful reminder. So what then begins to happen with communion? Well, uh, as I talk about this, please know I'm just giving you information. I'm not, I'm not denigrating or knocking anything. So there's a couple of traditions. The Roman Catholic Church um, began to move from, hey, we should take it more and more frequently because communion became one of seven Sacraments. And sacraments were a way to receive grace from God, right? So communion, or called the Eucharist, by the way, the word Eucharist means thanksgiving. Um, communion became essential. So about the fourth century, or the fifth century, excuse me, they started taking communion every day. Like, here's a way to get grace, let's do it every day. And then it kind of morphs, and nobody knows exactly how often do we celebrate this. But in 1215, Thomas Aquinas, okay, Thomas Aquinas, um, as he taught, he went to a couple of councils and the Roman Catholic Church accepted his teachings, right, I'm going to give you a big word, his teachings were transubstantiation, transubstantiation, so trans means change, 
And so Thomas Aquinas in the Roman Catholic Church adopted this concept that the wine and the bread trans, it transforms and it literally turns into the body and blood of Jesus. This is about 1215 this happens. And so because of that, this is now like actually it's been transformed into the body and blood of Jesus. Well, at least a whole bunch of other decisions, like one communion has to be closed. It's not open to anybody and it can only be served by a priest because it becomes consecrated when the priest prays for it. That's when it becomes transformed. And so there would even be a... Oh, like if you ever went to a mass for a Catholic funeral, it's clear most of the time that, hey, if you're not within the church, you're not allowed to take this because we literally believe this becomes the body and blood of Jesus. The reformers, specifically a guy named Zwingli in the 1500s, said, no, 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 we don't think that's quite right. So they came up with, instead of transubstantiation, consubstantiation, which means we believe that the actual body and blood is with, con with, is with the communion elements. And so that kind of worked its way out. And so uh, which one is right? I don't know. Here's what I do know. I do know that it's super important. And I, is it just deeply and profoundly symbolic? Does something actually happen to the elements? I probably end up on this side that this is just profoundly important and these two things, the bread and the wine, represent meaningful representation of who Jesus is and what he did. So, okay, what do we do with this now? Here's what I want to do. I want to end with giving you six words. Okay, six words about communion, about the blood and the wine and what they mean. And I think regardless of what tradition you come from, I, I think these six words everybody could agree on. Number one, simply the word communion. Communion. When you hold the body and blood of Jesus, this, the communion elements, it's speaking of communion. And communion means what? It means in relationship with. And this happens in two ways. Number one, when I hold these elements, I am recognizing that I am now in communion. I am in relationship with my creator. And it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the idea that God would come in the flesh in the person of Jesus and he would die in my place, which is now opened up relationship where I'm not hiding under fig leaves. I'm not afraid of God. I can now commune with my creator. What Jesus did through giving his life created relationship between me and God, between you and God. So this beautiful reality of communion, but there's a second aspect to the communion. It's that for centuries, the church has gathered together and you're in communion with other people too. Um, people who have very different backgrounds. People who are in different social or economic strata. Is that when you hold in your hands these elements, you're saying this, I'm in communion with these people. That we all have the same need. We needed a savior. We needed God to rescue us. So communion with God, communion with people. Here's the second word. Thanksgiving. Okay, so the, the, the word Eucharist. The New Testament just teaches when you hold those elements, one of the things that just should naturally come from my life is a thank you. Thank you that you became the final complete sacrifice. Thank you that paid a price I couldn't pay. Thank you that you're my Passover lamb, that God's judgment passes over me because your life, your death is applied to my life. And so one of the things we always want to experience when we're taking communion is just thankfulness. I'm so grateful. I didn't earn this. I did not achieve this. I was given this and I'm grateful. Here's the third word. Anticipation. Jesus says a couple of times that when he comes back, second time, he describes it as a banquet, 
or a feast. And not, not a banquet like the ones you've been to where the chicken's a little bit cold and the beans are freezing. No, no, no. He says, when I come back, here's what we're going to have. Because, because the price has been paid, that he's going to sit down at a banquet with everybody who is his. And Jesus says to his disciples as they're taking Passover, I'm never going to do this again until, until that day I return and I have this meal with my, 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 my family. And so there's, when you take it, there's also this sense of anticipation that this is just a little snack, okay? Not going to fill anybody up. But it represents a banquet, a meal, a feast that one day we will have with God. So it leads us towards this anticipation of his return. Next word would be this, reverence. We just cannot escape the 1 Corinthians 11 passage where... Communion, communion could just become so automatic and it's just something I do every week and it's part of a tradition. And I, I just think the New Testament argues against that. It says this is, a, this is sacred. And it uses the words like reflect, look within. Not, not wondering can I earn this or do I deserve this, but if, I, if I'm living a duplicitous life, right, and I'm hiding it from everybody, what Paul's saying is this, you can't hide that from God. You can't sit here and act like you've totally embraced what Jesus is doing. He says, you need to just be honest, reflect and say, Jesus, I need forgiveness. It moves us towards moments of repentance so that as we're holding the communion elements, it's not a mocking gesture. We're saying, this is profound and this is sacred. Our next word would be this, would be proclamation. Paul says when you do this, Jesus says when you do this as well, he says you proclaim my death until I come. So when you hold those communion elements, here's what you're saying. I believe. I'm announcing to the world around me. I'm announcing to forces seen and unseen. I'm declaring to God. I'm declaring to the enemies of God that Jesus Christ died. And when he died, he paid a price. He was the ultimate and final sacrifice. He is my Passover lamb. And I proclaim that the Lord's death has changed the course of human history. I proclaim that it's changed my relationship with God. And the last word is simply remembrance. Remembrance. Um, churches, Christianity can move forward. and We can emphasize a million different things, but there's something just so beautiful about we boil it all down to look up. It represents a God who died for us. And a little piece of bread that represents not a king who required his people to die for him, but a king who said, I'll die for you. And it brings us back to the core, to the most essential and most important aspect of the life of Jesus.